Welcome to TopCast, part two of chapter 16 of The Beginning of Infinity, The Evolution of Creativity. And last time I did very little reading. I think it was a record. I think I got through uh, uh, just a little over one page, which is, uh, I don't know if that's good or bad. Some people seem to like the comments. Some people um, like the comments and the reading to be put together. Um, so today we'll do a little more reading and some commentary as well and try and get through a more substantial part of this chapter. So without further ado, let me go back to the book. And David writes, I'm on page two, quote, Creativity would have been even less noticeable in, in the predecessor of our species, yet it must already have been evolving in that species, or ours would never have been the result. In fact, the advantage conferred by successive mutations that gave our predecessors brains slightly more creativity, or more precisely, more of the ability that we would now think of as creativity, must have been quite large, for by all accounts, modern humans evolved from ape-like ancestors very rapidly by gene evolution standards. Our ancestors must have been continually outbreeding their cousins. Moreover, during the period when creativity was evolving, the ability to replicate memes was evolving too. It is believed that some members of the species Homo erectus, living 500,000 years ago, knew how to make campfires. That knowledge was in their memes, not their genes. And once creativity and meme transmission are both present, they greatly enhance each other's evolutionary value, for then anyone who improves something also has the means to bequeath the invention to all future generations, thus multiplying the benefit to the relevant genes. And memes can be improved much faster by creativity than by random trial and error. Since there is no upper limit to the value of ideas, the conditions would have been there for a runaway coevolution between the two adaptations, creativity and the ability to use memes. Pause there in my reflection. So we've got a couple of things here. One is that these pre-homo sapien species that have existed on the earth have done so for a long time. It depends upon how you count what a human species is. But I was looking at this question about what counts as human earlier today. Now, when humans first of all, it depends on what you mean by human. Is a human a homo sapien or any kind of uh, sort of hominid that is able to creatively explain the world around us? A universal explainer. Now, in a recent podcast that I made almost simultaneously with this, I was talking about the possibility of alien life and whether or not um, here on Earth, the intelligent hominids, Homo erectus is one, perhaps Neanderthal was another, Homo sapiens, certainly us. Perhaps all of these had a common ancestor, the first creative thinking ape of a kind. And that first creative thinking ape of a kind, uh, I'm guessing, was a universal explainer. I don't know, but, uh, you know, I, I kind of am with the sentiments that are kind of expressed in The Beginning of Infinity, which I also mentioned in the last episode, that maybe it all came along in the one go. This creative capacity to explain the world. It wasn't there previously and then some individual had a mutation which enabled it, a genetic mutation which enabled it to explain the world around it, to explain, not merely react to the world around it. And that was the first universal explainer and it had an advantage. It had an advantage and so it had more offspring, some of those whom presumably, maybe all of them, had the capacity to explain the world around it, to think creatively, to think better than the other um, members of its species, although it probably would have been a new species by now, right? It's hard to know in biology how speciation kind of happens, like how do you draw the line between one species and another? Well, this might be a way, okay? If a human of a kind, a universal explainer of a kind, is that categorically different to the thing that it evolved from, then the thing that it evolved from didn't have the capacity to creatively explain the world, and then its offspring did, then that's a, that's a sharp dividing line between these two kinds of creatures. But when was the first of these kind of creatures, this first human type creatures? Well, you know, um, I know it's not the source of all wisdom, but Wikipedia um, puts the hominids back at six million years, but it calls the first kind of human Homo habilis 2.5 million years ago. And Homo erectus came after that, and then there are various other Homo species leading to us, Homo sapiens, which the um, the estimates vary, but it could be as much as 800,000 years ago, Homo sapiens came along. Now, why would the first 
universal explainer branch off into different species? Well, again, this is purely my conjecture. Well, it could happen the same way that any other kind of evolution happens. This first universal explainer has children, they have children and so on. We end up with a big tribe. Eventually the tribe gets very, very big and splits into two factions, which don't like one another, they become hostile to one another. And so they spread apart a long, long way apart for a long, long time. They exist separately. They are separated perhaps by a river, perhaps by a mountain range, who knows what. They evolved in Africa, they all evolved in Africa, but they might've been separated by a long way for a long time and eventually became two different species. This is how speciation happens. And perhaps even those two species themselves split into various species. And you could have ended up with lots of different human species, all of whom are able to think creatively. None of whom are actually using the creativity for anything particularly interesting or useful as David will come to, uh, but nonetheless, they're different human species with the ability to universally explain the world to be actually people. They are actually people, but only one of them survived through to today, Homo sapiens. Why? Well, we can talk about that. Okay. And let's maybe get back to the book. Otherwise I will end up going on another long tirade like last time and we won't get through enough of this chapter, which is, I suppose, too interesting not to discuss. But let's go back to the book. And are we just skipping a bit there where David simply talks about how these uh, early people just aren't making much progress. They're not making much progress. I urge you to read the chapter because I won't read the entire chapter. So I'm picking it up later and David writes, their ability, so these early people's ability to innovate was increasing rapidly, but they were barely innovating. This is a puzzle. Not because it is odd behavior, but because if innovation was that rare, how could there have been a differential effect on the reproduction of individuals with more or less ability to innovate? That there were thousands of years between noticeable changes presumably means that in most generations, even the most creative individuals in the population would not have been making many innovations. Hence, their greater ability to innovate would have caused no selection pressure in their favor. Why did tiny improvements in that ability keep spreading rapidly through the population? Our ancestors must have been using their creativity and using it to its limits and frequently for something, but evidently not for innovation. What else could it be used for? Pause there, just my emphasis here. So what David is saying is that we have these people, these people who can innovate, they've got the capacity to create, they are their memes are evolving as well. So they've got a combination of things, some, some useful memes, perhaps, probably yes, less useful memes, and an ability to create. But they're not innovating, they're not creating new technologies, they're not improving their lot in life at all. But they are nonetheless using creativity. They have to have been using the creativity, but nothing's improving. What the heck's going on? If you've been listening to this series and you've been reading the book along with me, you'll know the answer. You'll know the answer. But before we get to the answer, David's going to say a little bit about what the answer might not be. And he writes, One theory is that it did not evolve to provide any functional advantage, but merely through sexual selection. People used it to create displays to attract mates, colourful clothing, decoration, storytelling, wit, and the like. A preference to mate with the individuals with the most creative displays co-evolved with the creativity to meet that preference in an evolutionary spiral, so the theory goes, just like peahen's preference for peacock's tails. But creativity is an unlikely target for sexual selection. It is a sophisticated adaptation, which to this day, we are unable to reproduce artificially. So it is presumably much harder to evolve than attributes like coloration or the size and shape of body parts, some of which it is thought did indeed evolve by sexual selection in humans and many other animals. Creativity, as far as we know, evolved only once. Moreover, its most visible effects are cumulative. It would be hard to detect small variations in the creativity of potential mates on any one occasion, especially if that creativity was not being used for practical purposes. Consider how hard it would be today to detect tiny genetic differences in people's artistic abilities by means of an art competition. In practice, any such differences would be swamped by other factors. Pause there, my reflection and comments. There is a single sentence there, which I emphasize, which I think many people would perhaps skip over, but which I take to heart, where David writes, creativity as far as we know evolved only once. If that's true, and it may or may not be, wow, wow, because if it did happen, then you can consult my recent episode about alien life, um, 
Are We Alone, where I mention an academic. So if you're not going to listen to it, I'll, I'll mention it now. It kind of steals the thunder from the other episode, but oh well. That other academic is Peter Slezak. So um, he's a philosopher, and basically he agrees. He agrees that maybe something like creativity, human creativity, evolved only once here on the planet, which means it's not a convergent feature of evolution, which means it's not arising here, there, and everywhere like, you know, wings do. You know, birds have wings, insects have wings, certain kinds of mammals have wings, even fish have wings. So uh, wings evolve, right, commonly, they, to fill a niche in the environment, in a habitat. But this creativity doesn't seem to. It's evolved once. Why? Who knows? Maybe it was just a quirky thing and uh, it will never evolve again. It's just a one in a trillion, 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 you know, chance. Now, if you think that that can't be the case, well, just think about the fact that there appears to have evolved only once. And if you trace backwards in time, the fact that it evolved only once, all the way back to bacteria. So there's a sequence of evolutionary steps that have led from bacteria, the simplest life that we know of, through to humans, the most complicated sort of life form that we know of. Imagine there's only a hundred steps, but of course there's more than a hundred steps. And imagine each of those steps only has a one in 10 chance of occurring. Then you've got a one in 10 to the power of a hundred chance of repeating that sequence of evolutionary steps in order to get to creativity, because that apparently is what is required in order to produce the creativity. Lost my microphone there. That apparently is what is required in order to evolve creativity. This unique set of steps. It appears to be unique. <laughs> you know, if it wasn't unique, then it should have appeared other places at other times independently. So if it is unique and there, if there is only one route there or a very, very limited number of routes in order to get to evolution or in order to get to creativity, given the precursor of bacteria, <laughs> okay, and then the steps going through more and more complicated life forms until you get to a human. I am belaboring the point, but the reason I mention it here is it comes to bear on that um, alien life question. Because if it is truly unique, then it is truly unique. And it wouldn't matter how many planets you've got out there seeded with bacteria. None of them are going to evolve um, creativity. Um, and that's why we're alone. That's the simple answer to the Fermi paradox. Now, as I said in the other episode as well, I don't believe that. But that's not to say that I believe there are aliens out there either. I don't believe either of those things. I don't believe there are aliens. I don't believe there aren't aliens. I have no um, strong views on the matter in any way. I just know that each of these different ways of looking at the question are criticisms of each other. And they all seem good in many ways. And until we have more evidence, more interesting problems out there to solve in respect with respect to this question, um, there's not much to say. Well, I guess there's a lot to say, but there's nothing to say um, in terms of our knowledge of exactly what's going on. There's just a lot of unknowns, lots and lots of unknowns. And it's very interesting unknowns uh, with some interesting arguments, but very little knowledge and certainly no reason to believe any of these particular competing conceptions or ideas about alien life. And if you're interested in this question of alien life, which comes to bear on this particular thing here, whether or not creativity will evolve elsewhere in the universe, um, then yes, my other episode, um, you know, released maybe not necessarily alongside this one, but close to this one is perhaps worth listening to or of interest to you. Okay, let's get back to the book. Skipping a little bit. And David goes on to say, a more plausible variant of the sexual selection theory is that people choose mates according to social status rather than favoring creativity directly. Perhaps the most creative individuals were able to gain status more effectively through intrigue or other social manipulation. This could have given them an evolutionary advantage without producing any progress, which we would see evidence of. However, all such theories still face the problem of explaining why, if creativity was being used intensively for any purpose, it was not also used for functional purposes. Why would a chief who had gained power through creative intrigue not be thinking about better spears for hunting? Why wouldn't a subordinate who invented such a thing have been favoured? Similarly, wouldn't potential mates who were impressed by artistic displays also have been impressed by practical innovations? In any case, some practical innovations would themselves have helped the discoverers to produce better displays. And innovations sometimes have reach. A new skill of making a string of decorative beads in one generation might become the skill of making a slingshot in the next. So why were practical innovations originally so rare? 
From the discussion in the previous chapter, one might guess that it was because the tribes or families in which the people were living were static societies, in which any noticeable innovation would reduce one's status and hence presumably one's eligibility to mate. So how does one gain status, specifically by exercising more creativity than anyone else, without becoming noticeable as a taboo violator? Pausing there because we're about to get to David Deutz's brilliant, unique um, discovery suggestion here, but I, I think it's a um, uh, yeah, it is the best explanation I've heard of. So just to tie this up as we get to the solution, the problem, the problem is we have creative people in the past. These creative people in the past uh, have the capacity to innovate, but they're not innovating in any way we have any evidence for whatsoever. They haven't innovated much. So what are they using their creativity for? They can't be using it in order to change things too much because these people would have existed in a static society. And then you'll be seen as a taboo violator. You'll be seen as someone who needs to be cast out of such a society. You're unholy or um, unworthy in some way because you're not adhering to the strictures of the society, the customs and traditions. So what is David Deutsch's, David Deutsch's solution to this? He says, quote, I think there is only one way. It is to enact the society's memes more faithfully than the norm, to display exceptional conformity and obedience, to refrain exceptionally well from innovation. A static society has no choice but to reward that sort of conspicuousness. So can enhanced creativity help one to be less innovative than other people? That turns out to be a pivotal question to which I shall return below. But first, I must address a second puzzle. Okay, pausing there. So isn't that, isn't that great? You know, the, this whole idea, which I did steal the thunder from in a previous episode. But it, what we're saying here is, what David's saying here is that innovation, the capacity to innovate, can be used to more faithfully entrench the existing norms. So if you... And it still happens today. We, we know these kind of cultures. And in fact, we probably live in a version in some ways of these cultures. People who more faithfully adhere to the traditions and cultures that they find themselves in. Because that gives them status in such a society. So if your society is making no progress and is just going through rituals of a kind, religious rituals of a kind... Um, and not improving anything, the way to stand out in such a society, because you don't want to stand out by doing something new and creative, it's to do the thing that everyone else is doing, but better than they're doing it. Okay, so if you have to, you know, mold your hair in a particular way, if you mold your hair in a way that's just like that, but better without even a hair out of place, where someone else had one hair out of place and you have none, then you're doing even better. Okay, let's go back to the book. His second puzzle, David's second puzzle for this chapter, and it's subtitled, How Do You Replicate a Meaning? And David writes, Meme replication is often characterized, for example by Blackmore, as imitation. But that cannot be so. A meme is an idea, and we cannot observe ideas inside other people's brains, nor do we have the hardware to download them from one brain to another, like computer programs, nor to replicate them like DNA molecules. So we cannot literally copy or imitate memes. The only access we have to their content is through their holder's behavior, including their speech, and consequences of their behavior, such as their writing. Meme replication always follows this pattern. One observes the holder's behavior, directly or indirectly. Then later, sometimes immediately, sometimes after years of such observation, memes from the holder's brains are present in one's own brain. But how do they get there? It looks a bit like induction, does it not? But induction is impossible. The process often seems to involve imitating the holders. For instance, we learn words by imitating their sounds. We learn how to wave by being waved to and imitating what we see. Thus, outwardly, and even to our own introspection, we appear to be copying aspects of what other people do and remembering what they say and write. This common sense misconception is even corroborated by the fact that our species' closest living relatives, the great apes, also have a much more limited, but nevertheless striking, ability to imitate. But as I shall explain, the truth is that imitating people's actions and remembering their utterances could not possibly be the basis of human meme replication. 
In reality, those play only a small, and for the most part, inessential role. Meme acquisition comes so naturally to us that it is hard to see what a miraculous process it is, or what is really happening. It is especially hard to see where the knowledge is coming from. There is a great deal of knowledge in even the simplest of human memes. When we learn to wave, we learn not only the gesture, but also which aspects of the situation made it appropriate to wave, and how and to whom. We are not told most of this, yet we learn it anyway. Similarly, when we learn a word, we also learn its meaning, including highly inexplicit subtleties. How do we acquire that knowledge? Not by imitating the holders. Pause there, just my reflection. So he's really setting this up really well. And thoroughgoing Popperians may have guessed the answer. Um, well, they've probably read the book anyway, if they're listening to this. Um, but the fact is that we manage to gain this knowledge from people. We gain memes. We understand, for example, what waving is, in what situations you do the waving, and the kind of inexplicit knowledge that a wave can convey. You know, if I'm doing this, then that has a certain amount of inexplicit knowledge in it. Um, you know, I sort of look a bit awkward doing that. <laughs> you know, but to try and explain exactly how I look in words, it's not you know, my eyes are a bit sort of like, but if I'm like, yeah, hi. <laughs> you know, I can do all sorts of different waves, can't I? And each of them ha may have a different look on my face and might be waving my hand faster or slower. And it has, and if you had to describe that to someone later on, you might say, Brett was waving in a strange way. Well, I don't really know, but you can't, we kind of both know, you know, when you're waving to someone, whether it's a genuine wave or it's an awkward wave, whether it's a shy wave, whether it's an excited wave, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's what David means by inexplicit stuff. And you know the situations where you should and shouldn't do the kind of waving. And what the what you're conveying, it can convey a whole lot of a whole lot of knowledge can be conveyed by a wave. Um, you can wave people away. You can wave to someone in such a way as to say, Hi, I acknowledge you over there on the other side of the street, but I don't want to talk to you right now. I'm too busy, okay, for example. There's lots of things that um, uh, simple gestures and simple words and so on. There's lots of meaning that can be contained within these things, the inexplicit as well as the explicit knowledge that happens to be there. Okay, so that's what David's setting up. How do we acquire the knowledge he's just asked? And he said, not by imitating the holders. Now he's going to talk about Popper, and this is just such a wonderful story. So back to the book, and David writes, quote, Popper used to begin his lecture course on the philosophy of science by asking the students simply to observe. Then he would wait in silence for one of them to ask what they were supposed to observe. This was his way of demonstrating one of the many flaws in the empiricism that is still part of common sense today. So he would explain to them that scientific observation is impossible without pre-existing knowledge about what to look at, what to look for, how to look and how to interpret what one sees. And it would explain that, therefore, theory has to come first. It has to be conjectured, not derived. Popper could have made the same point by asking his audience to imitate rather than to merely observe. The logic would have been the same. Under what explanatory theory should they imitate? Whom should they imitate? Popper? In that case, should they walk to the podium push him out of the way and stand where he had been standing? If not, should they at least try to face the rear of the room to imitate where he was facing? Should they imitate his heavy Austrian accent or should they speak in their normal voices because he was speaking in his normal voice? Or should they do nothing special at the time but merely include such demonstrations in their lectures when they themselves became professors of philosophy? There are infinitely many possible interpretations of imitate Popper, each defining a different behaviour for the imitator. Many of these ways would look very different from each other. Each way corresponds to a different theory of what ideas in Popper's mind were causing the observed behaviour. So there is no such thing as just imitating the behaviour. Still less, therefore, can one discover those ideas by imitating it. One needs to know the ideas before one can imitate the behaviour. So imitating behaviour cannot be how we acquire memes. 
The hypothetical genes that caused meme replication by imitation would also have to specify whom to imitate. Blackmore, for instance, suggests that the criterion may be imitate the best imitators, but this is impossible for the same reason. One can only judge how well someone is imitating if someone already knows or has guessed what, which aspect of behaviour and whose, they are imitating, and which of the circumstances they are taking into account and how. The same holds if the behaviour consists of stating the memes. As Popper remarked, it is impossible to speak in such a way that you cannot be misunderstood. One can only state the explicit content which is insufficient to define the meaning of a meme or anything else. Even the most explicit of memes, such as laws, have inexplicit content without which they cannot be enacted. For example, many laws refer to what is reasonable, but no one can define that attribute accurately enough for, say, a person from a different culture to be able to apply the definition in judging a criminal case. Hence, we certainly do not learn what reasonable means by hearing its meaning stated. But we do learn it, and the versions of it that are learned by people in the same culture are sufficiently close for laws based on it to be practicable. In any case, as I remarked in the previous chapter, we do not explicitly know the rules by which we behave. We know the rules, meanings and patterns of speech of our native language largely inexplicitly. Yet we pass its rules on with remarkable fidelity to the next generation, including the ability to apply them in situations the new holder has never experienced, and including patterns of speech that people explicitly try to prevent the next generation from replicating. Pause there, just my uh, little comment there. Yes, this is a remarkable thing about language acquisition that many people who have been involved in, let's say, language teaching have uh, always been fascinated by. And that is that every English speaker, almost every English speaker, inexplicitly knows the rules of English grammar. When you hear a grammatically incorrect sentence, almost everyone can recognise it. However, not, it's not necessarily the case that everyone can explain what the error might be. You know, to someone speaking English, learning to speak English from another culture, um, you might, you know, be entertaining them in your house, and you might say, um, "Have you had a drink yet?" And they might say in response, "I have a drink," and you don't know what they mean. Do they mean they have had a drink, which is the past perfect tense? Do they mean? They want to have a drink. I, I would like to have a drink. Um, but they've said, I have a drink in response to your question, have you had a drink? Whereas a native English speaker will say, no, I have not had a drink. Or yes, I have had a drink. They inexplicitly know that this is the way in which you're supposed to respond. But a non-native English speaker who's struggling to understand the language doesn't know the grammar very well. And so um, English teachers, people who learn to be English teachers, often have to learn explicitly what the rules of grammar happen to be, just so they can explain it to the language learner. You know, this is the past perfect tense, and this is just the past simple tense, and this is the present tense, and so on. They might have to learn these things um, so that they can make the inexplicit explicit. In some cases, making the inexplicit explicit is helpful for learning. Sometimes it might not be helpful for learning. You know, language learning and teaching is a certainly a fraught area. I did it for um, quite a while. And this issue about um, how we pass on these rules with remarkable fidelity to the next generation is, is, can be a great mystery. You know, we, the, all, all the things about pronunciation of words, you know, the sounds that certain things, they become deeply ingrained over time. And some people just appear to have better ears for learning languages. I know I'm terrible <laughs> if the language starts to deviate too much from the typical sounds that an English speaker will speak. I seem not to be able to get my mouth in the right position because there's a, in fact, that, that goes into phonetics. There's a huge amount of inexplicit content in where your tongue actually has to be when you make certain sounds in certain other cultures. I've tried to learn Korean and I'm absolutely terrible at it because the tongue has to be in different places. It has to be closer or further away from the teeth than what we use in English. And so this can be hard because Koreans, of course, naturally, in explicit, with inexplicit knowledge, know where the, the, the tongue happens to be. In fact, the, the entire alphabet in Korean, interestingly enough, um, is uh, it's an alphabet, kind of like English is, except the characters, some of the characters represent the position of the tongue in the mouth, which is really cool and interesting. Anyway, way off topic. Let's go back to the book. And David writes, 
The real situation is that people need inexplicit knowledge to understand laws and other explicit statements, not vice versa. Philosophers and psychologists work hard to discover and to make explicit the assumptions that our culture tacitly makes about social institutions, human nature, right and wrong, time and space, intention, causality, freedom, necessity, and so on. But we do not acquire those assumptions by reading the results of such research. It is entirely the other way around. If behaviour is impossible to imitate without prior knowledge of the theory causing the behaviour, how is it that apes, famously, can ape? They have memes. They can learn a new way of opening a nut by watching another ape that already knows that way. How is it that apes are not confused by the infinite ambiguity of what it means to imitate? Even parrots, famously parrot. They can commit to memory dozens of sounds that they have heard and repeat them later. How do they cope with the ambiguity of which sounds to imitate and when to repeat them? They cope with it by knowing the relevant inexplicit theories in advance, or rather, their genes know them. Evolution has built into the genes of a parrot an implicit definition of what imitating means to them. To them, it means recording sequences of sounds that meet some inborn criterion and later replaying them under conditions that meet some other inborn criterion. An interesting fact follows about parrot psychology. The parrot's brain must also contain a translation system that analyzes incoming nerve signals from the ears and generates outgoing ones that will cause the parrot's vocal cords to play the same sounds. That translation requires some quite sophisticated computation, which is encoded in genes, not memes. It is thought to be achieved in part by a system based on mirror neurons. These are neurons that fire when an animal performs a given action, and also when the animal perceives the same action being performed by another. These neurons have been identified experimentally in animals that have the capacity to imitate. Scientists who believe that human meme replication is a sophisticated form of imitation tend to believe that mirror neurons are a key to understanding all sorts of functions of the human mind. Unfortunately, that cannot possibly be so. Uh, and I'll skip the next little bit and because David talks about um, parroting, you know, what, what a parrot does. And the fact that a parrot will parrot anything. It will parrot a dog bark. It will parrot a ringing doorbell. Um, a parrot seems to have no choice about the sound that it makes. In fact, um, I might put up a more amazing more amazing than a parrot, I have to say, is the Australian bird, the lyrebird. And if you've never heard the lyrebird before, it is far more impressive than any parrot you will ever hear. The lyrebird will imitate anything. It will imitate anything. And one of the most amazing things that it's imitated is, an environmentalist love to use this one, of course, um, is the, 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 the imitation of a lyrebird of a chainsaw. A chainsaw. The chainsaw that is coming to chop down its habitat. I shouldn't laugh about that. You know, the lyrebirds are fine in Australia. They're not they're not going extinct or endangered or anything. We've got lots of forest and lots of bushland. But yes, the 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 um the lyrebird will imitate it. It'll imitate camera sounds. I'll play the clip if I can find the clip and I'll, I'll put it up here. And that's a car alarm. <laughs> Moving on from the lyrebird, back to the book after skipping a little bit and David writes, now imagine that a parrot had been present at Popper's lectures and learned to parrot some of Popper's favourite sentences. It would in a sense have imitated some of Popper's ideas. In principle an interested student could later learn the ideas by listening to the parrot, but the parrot would merely be transmitting those memes from one place to another, which is no more than the air in lecture theatre does. The parrot could not be said to have acquired the memes because it would be reproducing only some of the countless behaviours that they could produce. The parrot its subsequent behaviour as a result of having learned the sounds by heart, such as its responses to questions, would not resemble Popper's. The sound of the meme would be there, but its meaning would not. And it is the meaning, the knowledge, that is the replicator. Okay, then David talks about how the fact that the parrot is not oblivious to the sounds, it doesn't indiscriminately record things like a recorder, like an electronic recorder will record everything. The parrot is clearly only recording specific things. And then David goes on to talk about apes and some of uh, aping, aping can be so complicated that it appears as if it's learning. 
Um, so for example, if one ape learns to crack a nut better than another ape, then the other ape can tend to learn from the, the first ape that has improved something. Now, the, the kicker to this, the kicker to the fact that, okay, an ape can learn to use a tool and people are unaccountably impressed by the kind of tool use that goes on among some animals. Uh, we have crows in Australia as well, I'm mentioning another Australian animal, I think crows exist around the world, but uh, the tool use of the crow uh, is often cited as a particularly impressive example of intelligence in the lower species. David writes how such activities may seem to depend upon explanation, on understanding how and why, why each action that can be complicated, making a tool or cracking a nut in, in various contexts by an ape, seems to be like learning. It seems to be like explanatory knowledge. But as he says here, quote, in a remarkable series of observational and theoretical studies, the evolutionary psychologist and animal behavior researcher, Richard Byrne, has shown they, the apes, achieve this by a process that he calls behavior passing, which is analogous to the grammatical analysis or passing of human speech or computer programs. And I won't, I think I'm just going to encourage people to go and read the book rather than me reading it out, which seems strange. I mean, I'm kind of taking out the, the punchline of this, but there is this thing called behavior passing where it's not like conjecture and refutation. It is instead how there's already a repertoire of possible behaviors that an ape can undertake. And within these, this repertoire, it's like a library of possible different things that this creature can undertake. Then they can be uh, combined in different ways in order to do something that is, might not have been encountered before by any members of those species. And as David says of this behavior passing, and it's worth looking up, behavior passing is a very inefficient method requiring a lot of watching of behaviors that a human could mimic almost immediately by understanding their purpose. Also, it allows only a few fixed options for connecting the behaviors together. So only relatively simple memes can be replicated. Apes can only copy certain individual actions instantly, the ones of which they have pre-existing knowledge through their mirrored neuron system, but it takes them years to learn a repertoire of memes that involve combinations of actions. Okay, and then I'm skipping yet more because I just want to get to the section about how humans are different. They're not just imitating behavior uh, as an ape would or as a parrot would. Okay, we're categorically different. How? Because David says, quote, human beings acquiring human memes are doing something profoundly different when an audience is watching a lecture or a child is learning a language, their problem is almost the opposite of that of parroting or aping. The meaning of the behavior that they are observing is precisely what they are striving to discover and do not know in advance. The actions themselves and even the logic of how they are connected are largely secondary and are often entirely forgotten afterwards. For example, as adults, we remember few of the actual sentences from which we learn to speak. If a parrot had copied snatches of Popper's voice at a lecture, it would certainly have copied them with his Austrian accent. Parrots are incapable of copying an utterance without its accent. But a human student might well be unable to copy it with the accent. In fact, a student might well acquire a complex meme at a lecture without being able to repeat a single sentence spoken by the lecturer, even immediately afterwards. In such a case, the student has replicated the meaning, which is the whole content, of the meme without imitating any actions at all. As I said, imitation is not at the heart of human meme replication. Okay, so I'm going to pause and I'm going to end there today. Maybe a little bit shorter than normal, but I actually have made, um, I made three podcast episodes today. There's one out there, uh, which is just me talking to camera and not reading about aliens. One there, which is um, a more carefully considered piece about cosmology and the effect on economics that cosmology has. And finally, this one today. So it's been a bit of <laughs> my voice is starting to go. So um, if you've enjoyed this, if you've enjoyed any of my other podcasts, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. It's uh, very valuable to me, uh, very heartening that I've, I've increased uh, my number of supporters. I'm up over 20 now, which is um, very heartening for me. Um, I'm very much enjoying doing this and we'll have a few more episodes 
for this chapter and move on to the next chapter, Unsustainable, which will be a, an exciting, a very exciting chapter. Not to say this isn't exciting, we're getting right into this and we're <laughs> taking our time getting through it, but um, Unsustainable will be a, I don't want to say controversial, but it'll be a fun chapter when we do eventually get there. Thank you again to everyone who's watching, everyone who's listening, and to all of my Patreon subscribers. Until next time, bye-bye.